Would you open up in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3? Luke chapter 3. Today we're continuing through our sermon series in the Gospel of Luke. And today in Luke 3, we return to John the Baptist. You'll remember in the first two chapters, we have a series of parallels, paralleling the announcement of John's birth and the announcement of Jesus' birth. The birth of John and the birth of Jesus. The song of Zechariah and the song of Mary. The childhood of John and the childhood of Jesus. And today we get the ministry of John in preparation for and in parallel to the ministry of Jesus. This is the last of the parallels that we have between John and Jesus. We get to the genealogy in verse 23 and following. Uh, we'll be moving full speed through Jesus' ministry. So this is our last complete glimpse of John. John will be involved and relevant for the rest of the book. But this is our last um, John the Baptist passage, so to speak. So let's pray together, and we'll turn to the passage. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, today would you reveal yourself to us by your Holy Spirit through your word. Would you renew our hearts and sanctify us for your glory, to follow you in obedience and repentance. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 1. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I know that some of you have probably coached um, youth sports before. When I was in high school, I coached uh, some third and fourth grade basketball for a couple of years, and it, it was a lot of fun. Um, but one of the things that you, you catch on to pretty quick when you're coaching kids um, is that they don't know a whole lot about the fundamentals, right? So you walk into this, this room, and you have, in the case of basketball, you have some kids who have never touched a basketball before, and you have some kids who are really talented, really athletic, who play a lot on the playground. But what they all need is they all need to learn how to uh, stop. They all need to learn how to dribble. You know, those really talented kids will do this kind of thing while they're dribbling, right? They all need to learn how to shoot, how to pass. Whether it's your, your least talented, least athletic player, which was me most of the time, or whether it's your most talented, most athletic player, both can be ruined by a neglect of the fundamentals. And so today, when we come to John's ministry, 
I'm arguing that what, what John is bringing to us here is one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. One of the skills that we need to develop, one of the things that we need to know how to do, and one of the things that we need uh, not forget. See, it's a mistake to think that once we've, we've crossed the starting line, once we've repented once, that that's all we need to do. What John actually calls us to do is to repent day by day and to live a life of repentance. Because you'll notice, we'll talk about this more in detail later, but in verse 7, John calls the crowds that come out to be baptized, he calls them a brood of vipers. These are a sinful people that are coming before John, seeking repentance. And we, too, are a sinful people. We, too, are a people in need of God's grace. And so John's message to them is John's message to us. And it's a call to repentance. There's specifically three things that John calls us to repent of. First, he calls us to repent of false devotion. Second, he calls us to repent of false fruit. And third, he calls us to repent of false piety. Repent of false devotion, false fruit, and false piety. First, repent of false devotion. One of the most striking things about Luke's gospel is how free he feels to address political and religious powers of his day. So there's, there's two main places he does this. He does this in Luke 2, which most of you are probably familiar with, in, in the decree of Caesar Augustus and things like that. But when we come to Luke 3, he's much more specific, and his language is much uh, stronger. So Luke 2, we have kind of an idea of what, what era he's talking about, what, uh, what time he's talking about. Here in Luke 3, we have historical records of all of these people. We're quite certain when they reigned, when they ruled. And he's, he's in a way, provoking them and, and calling them out. Because if you look back at the history of the Bible, look through the Old Testament, you always see this conflict between prophets and kings and their court priests. The prophets are always called out to rebuke and preach the word of God to the kings. And so examples of this would be Samuel and Saul, Nathan and David, Isaiah and Hezekiah. And all of these prophets are in conflict with these kings and working to sanctify the kings. And so John's call is no different. John is a prophet who is called into a context, a historical context, where we have evil kings and evil priests, false kings and false priests, and he deals directly with both of these. So first, the false kings. Look at the people listed in Luke 3.1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. So here Luke is referring to two different sets of kings. On the one hand, you have the Roman rulers. You have Tiberius Caesar, who's the emperor of the Roman Empire, and his regent in Judea, his regent in Jerusalem, Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Now, most of you probably know this, but one of the, the titles that the Caesars took on for themselves is Divi Filius, son of God. So one of the things that the Caesars did, one of the things that the Romans were doing, was making a claim to the divine throne of God. The Romans, as a propaganda tactic to take control over the whole world, would claim divine authority to do it. They would claim divine authority to rule over all these people groups, all of these nations that they had conquered. And in Judea, Pilate is the representative of this claim. He's ruling over Jerusalem as an angel of the gods, as an angel of the Caesars, and he's claiming for Tiberius the very throne of God in Jerusalem. So that's the first set of kings, the Romans. The second set of kings are what we call the Herodians. So if you're, if you're familiar with the birth story of Jesus, the king during that time was Herod the Great. Uh, what we have here is a different Herod, Herod Antipas, who is his son, and Philip also is his son. Uh, the Tetrarchs, after Herod the Great died, divided uh, his kingdom into four, so that's why they're called tetrarchs. Tetrarch means a uh, king of a fourth, basically. But the problem is, these men are not the rightful rulers of Judah. In the Old Testament, we see that the scepter of uh, David's kingdom belongs to Judah. The scepter of God's kingdom belongs to Judah. The royal line comes from David, who is a son of the tribe of Judah. Judah. 
that the Herodians are not from this tribe. In fact, the Herodians are not even Israelites properly. The Herodians are Edomites. They are children of Esau. They're kind of halfway related. They're, you know, they share a father in Abraham, but their claim to the throne is not right. And so uh, they have made a claim. They're seeking to wrest control of the human throne of God's son, the human throne of David's son. The Romans make a claim to the divine throne. The Herodians make a claim to the human throne. Now for us, we know that these thrones are one and the same. Both belong to the Son of God. Both belong to Jesus Christ. Both belong to Jesus, who is David's son. And so John's call to repentance for these men is a call for them to submit to Jesus along with the people under them as representatives of these nations, as representatives of the empire, as representatives of the Galileans and the Abilinians and the Aturians, they're called to submit to Jesus. Now this challenge is problematic, to say the least, for these kings. We'll actually see later that John's challenge results in his martyrdom. And this conflict between prophet and king is replayed in the life of John. So we're called to repent of false devotion to false kings, but we're also called to repent of false devotion to false priests. In verse 2, we move from this, this royal sphere, from this political sphere, to the religious sphere. And John is prophesying during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, if you know the end of the story, these names should be familiar to you. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests who presided over the crucifixion of Jesus, who presided over his trial and crucifixion. Now, Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. The way that this worked, uh, very similar to the way the Herodians were, got their throne in um, Judah. The way it worked, the way you became a high priest during Jesus' day is you knew the right people. You had the right amount of money. And so Annas was probably buddied up with the Romans. And Annas was appointed as high priest because of his influence, because of his wealth, because his family uh, was well respected among the Romans. And they trusted him. Now, he was eventually deposed. And uh, five of his sons after him ruled as the high priest. But as throughout his life, and you'll actually see this is why there's two high priests at this point, Throughout Annas' life, even though he was removed from the role as high priest, he continued to serve and exercise influence as high priest. But these, these men have the same problem that the Herodians have. They're not the rightful office holders of the high priest. And they've come to this high priesthood, not by way of the prescribed means, but through another way, through, through sinfulness. And so when the word of God comes to John, it is a condemnation of this religious establishment. The men who were appointed to be the voice of God have failed. They've sinned. They're under the authority of the Romans, not under the authority of the word of God, and John must step in to speak truth to them. So instead of these kings, instead of these priests, we get John. And we get his job description from the book of Isaiah. John is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John's job then, according to Isaiah, is to straighten out the way for Jesus. John is announcing not just uh, that Jesus is coming, but he's announcing a apocalyptic, cataclysmic event. Jesus' coming is, is a world-changing, world-overturning event where the kings and priests of this world will be deposed and replaced by the one true priest king, Jesus Christ, who will throw them down. This is the promise that God gives us. That the salvation of God will make every place flat and smooth. He will make all things right under the authority and rulership and mediation of Jesus Christ. So often we, we commit ourselves to um, people and to institutions that look really good from a human perspective. You know, if, if you lived in this day, it would have looked really good to be friends with the Romans, right? They were the ones with the money. They were the ones with the swords and the power. And 
they looked like the most effective way to rule the world. Whether it's political leaders, media personalities, maybe something less tangible like an ideology. So often we look to the world for what, what works best. Some of us are pragmatists. We look at who, who can draw the biggest crowds? Who has the most money? Who's the most effective? Whatever we mean by effectiveness. Some of us are idealists. We look to either some golden age in the past as, as perfection that we're, we're striving toward that ideal. We look to some human uh, ideal standard. But, but none of these things matter if we're not ultimately submitting to the standards of God. None of these things matter if we're not ultimately submitting to his standards for truth and for goodness and for beauty. On the outside, the kings and the priests of John's day looked powerful. They looked like they knew what they were doing. And if you were smart, you were on their side. But John didn't do that. John went out away from the city. John went into the wilderness around the Jordan. John took on a life of poverty. And John, rather than taking on a sword, he would eventually die by the sword. And this is God's wisdom. It's something we need to wrestle with is the fact that God's wisdom is foolishness to men. God's wisdom is going out into the wilderness and eating locusts and preaching to a bunch of people who want to be dunked in some water. See, we're Christians. We can see where things are really going. And with eyes of faith, we don't have to gamble on the things of this world. We don't have to gamble on the political leaders of this world. We don't have to gamble on um, the financial institutions. We don't have to gamble on um, which way things are going because we have victory in Jesus. We can stand with the prophet against false devotion to things of this earth. We can cling to the victorious cross of Christ. So repent of false devotion. Repent of false devotion to false kings and false priests. Number two, repent of false fruit. So verse six, giving John's job description, we see that John's call is to announce the coming salvation of God. Now, when you and I think of salvation, we think in, in positive terms. But, but John's announcement runs radically against our perceptions of what salvation is. Notice what he says in verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up for children Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. See, John's announcement of the gospel is not mushy. It's not sentimental. The beginning of John's gospel proclamation is scathing. It's offensive. Now, we're used to hearing the language, brood of vipers, and um, it doesn't come across in the way that it would come across these people to us because we're so used to hearing it. But think about the connotations of that. It's a reference back to Genesis 3. The, the seed of the serpent. He's calling them children of Satan. And he's saying, you are the people that the seed of the woman will come to crush. You are the people who are aligned with the evil one. You are a brood of vipers. Now, this is offensive to a Jewish audience, and he anticipates their objection because he knows they're going to say, oh, well, we're not children of Satan. We're not children of the serpent. We are children of Abraham. We have the covenant. But he wisely anticipates their warning, anticipates their um, objection, and he identifies, uh, he's possibly the first one in the New Testament to identify this principle. Of course, the Jews are the biological seed of Abraham. Biologically, historically, he is their father. But the true seed of Abraham are those who share in the faith of Abraham. This is something Paul talks about. Paul talks about it in Romans 4, Romans 9 through 11. The true offspring of Abraham, the true Israel, are those who trust in God and in his seed, the seed of the woman. Yes, and Paul affirms this in Romans, there's some good in being a biological Jew. There's some good in being a part of the old covenant community. But that's not enough 
True children of Abraham live in accordance with their identity. They live out who they are. They bear good fruit in keeping with repentance. So John's warning is as serious as death. If you don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance, God's salvation is dangerous to you. If you are not clinging to Jesus in faith, God's salvation is dangerous to you. Because God's salvation and God's judgment go hand in hand. We, as Christians, rejoice in the reality that we will eventually be raised from the dead. We will eventually have, enjoy a bodily resurrection and communion with God. But for those who are not in Christ, the resurrection from the dead is a terror. Because that's the day of judgment. And so John is saying, if they, if, if this, these crowds, and if we submit to the change that God seeks to bring about in us now, we will be saved from future judgment. If we die to ourselves now, if we submit to death now, then we can have resurrection life in the future. If we die to ourselves now in submission to God, we will be nurtured in the word to bear good fruit. If we don't, we'll still be purified. We'll still submit. The, the, the promise is true. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But it will not be pleasant. If we don't submit to God now, we'll be purified by fire and we'll submit under the axe. So the question for you is this. Will, will you repent of your false fruit? Will you cut away the dead and rotten, rotten works of the flesh? Or will God remove them by blade and fire in the judgment? And so this is the challenge that God poses to us through John's testimony. And the natural question that arises is what shall we do? If this is true, if we need to die to ourselves, what shall we do? Repent of false fruit. That leads us to our third point. Repent of false piety. This is the question that the people ask. John gives them this warning of judgment and they say, what then shall we do? Look at verse 10. The crowds asked him, what then shall we do? Here's his answer. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. And so we have three different groups coming before John and asking what they must do. We have the crowds in general. We have uh, two other groups who kind of are representative of um, pretty serious sinners in this day, the tax collectors and the soldiers. But in each case, to all of these three groups, his answer is similar. He calls them to do something, to externalize their repentance. See, often we think about repentance as purely internal. We think of repentance as being good feelings about God and bad feelings about sin. But what repentance really is, is action. It's our belief in God being worked out in what we do. See, John's answer is not about feelings. It's about what they must do, what fruit they must bear. Now, two things can be true at the same time. Scripture tells us, and this is true, that God doesn't desire sacrifices but a contrite heart. That's Psalm 51. That is true. But it's also true, James 2, that faith without works is dead. And so what God requires of us is both a pure heart and pure fruit. Because a pure heart, a heart that is clinging to Christ, a heart that believes in Jesus, is a heart that produces pure works and pure fruit. One is, the, the fruit is a natural consequence of true faith and a true heart uh, striving after God. So consider Jesus' parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And they go into the temple to pray. The Pharisee goes into the temple and he says, I thank God that I'm not like these sinners. The tax collector says, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, I think it's a mistake to think that the Pharisees were just a bunch of horrible people. Now, that's what, that's what it can kind of look like when you're reading the New Testament. The Pharisees are always in conflict with Jesus. 
And that's true. They, they, they were dealing with, uh, struggling with who Jesus was and in conflict with him. But in the first century, the Pharisees were the people who really loved God's word. The Pharisees were the people who believed in the truths of the faith. The Pharisees were the ones who believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in the truth of scripture and they were committed to keeping it. The problem was that their piety was false. They claimed to be true followers of God, but they didn't live in accord with their claims. Their heart was maybe moving in the right direction, but it wasn't overflowing in action. See, their, their problem was not over-application of the law. The Pharisees' problem was not over-application, over-application of the law. The problem was under-application. They would pick the laws that were easy to do. They would tie that of their spice rack, for example. But when it came to loving their, honoring their father and mother, they would disobey that commandment. So their legalism was in the under-application. Through their, through their words and appearances, they followed God, but they didn't follow him in their actions. So what does John tell the crowds to do? He tells them to be generous with their possessions. He tells them to give their excess to those who lack. He tells them to be content with the lot that God has given them. He calls them to turn away from the ways of the world, which are extortion, selfishness, and violence. To put those things away, and he calls them to simple daily obedience and faith. Notice he doesn't call them to strict adherence to the ceremonial law. Now, cer- ceremonial law is good. There's the, it's God's word. But ultimately, repentance doesn't look like uh, Pharisaic legalism. Repentance doesn't lo- look like um, a heart piety that doesn't overflow into action. Repentance looks like obedience. Now, how many of us are like that, though? How many of us want to hold our leaders accountable? We want to hold our communities accountable? We want to hold our families and our churches accountable to obedience? But when it comes to our own obedience, we fudge it a little bit. We may say the right words. We may show up on time for church. We hang Bible verses and crosses in our houses. But in the day-to-day, when push comes to shove, we're no different from the rest of the world. Our own words, our own decorations in our houses, our own Facebook posts condemn us. It's very easy to talk about biblical fidelity. It's very easy to talk about obedience. But when confronted with our sin, we so often make excuses. It's very easy to talk about obedience in the abstract, but when God calls us to obedience in our daily lives, it's very easy to make excuses. When God, God's word, when God's word tells us to repent, we, we so often respond with a momentary faithfulness. We respond in repentance in our hearts, but then we don't let that faith response continue into Monday morning or even sometimes Sunday afternoon. True Christian faith is not just repeating the right words. It's not just, um, it's not just looking the part. True Christian faith really and truly turns away from sin and toward God and true repentance. True piety is whole life commitment to Christ our King. So repent of false piety. Repent of false devotion. Repent of false fruit and repent of false piety. Don't forget the fundamentals. Repentance is the core of the Christian faith. Repentance is the first skill we learn in the most difficult thing that we need to do each and every day. So practice it, don't neglect it. No, in closing, I wanna read a quote from John Calvin. You know, we, we think of John Calvin as kind of this brooding, dark guy, but John Calvin is actually a very, um, He's a beautiful writer, and he's, he's a man who's wholly devoted to love of God. Now, this is what he says about doctrine and belief in repentance. He says, True doctrine is not a matter of the tongue, but of life. Neither is Christian doctrine grasped only by the intellect and memory. Rather, doctrine is rightly received when it takes possession of the entire soul and finds a dwelling place in the most intimate affections of the heart. In order for doctrine to be fruitful to us, it must overflow into our hearts and spread into our daily routines.
and truly transform us within. So the question for you is, does the truth transform you? Because transformational truth is repentance. Repentance happens when the truths of God overflow out of your heart and into obedience. Are you repenting continually? Do you have a heart of repentance? And does that heart of repentance flow from a commitment to your faith in Jesus? This is the question for you today, and this is your call. Repent of false devotion and devote yourself to the true priest king. Repent of false fruit and bear good fruit. Repent of false piety and live out your faith and obedience to Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.